How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, New Pacific 3 Eastern, Sunday 3 Pacific 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian. And it is Tuesday here on the show, and you know what that means? Well, we got a lot to talk about here today, don't we? Yes. NXT is tonight. That should be exciting. Especially because it's the return of Booker T. He's back. We got the full lineup for the show, as well as Dynamite tomorrow, which does not have much advertised, but they do have something very big, which is Sting's, that's how they're advertising it, final Dynamite appearance before retirement. So we'll talk about that. Will Ospreay will also appear on Dynamite on Wednesday. We have got the Raw show from last night, which was a weird show. There was a lot of talking, a lot of angles, and the matches weren't even all that great. There were a couple that were all right, but a lot of short matches and a very weird final segment. And we're here on the road to WrestleMania, so there's going to be more of this. And the funny thing is, you know, we were talking yesterday in Observer Radio and Dave said, well, you know, they got to shoot all these angles for Mania. we got to fill up these cards. And I was like, well, they shot all these angles for matches we already know. The show didn't even end with one new match. So we'll tell you about that. Plus, a lot of news. New Japan star headed to WWE. A bunch of new hires in WWE, as well as promotions that we can talk about here. We've got an update on Julia. We've got all of the ratings from this past weekend. We have got the Rampage, Collision, and SmackDown numbers. And as expected, I mean, even though that WWE pay-per-view aired very, very early in the morning on Saturday, it still crushed Collision because people weren't staying up until 5 in the morning to watch that show. So all of the news, Mike Sempervivi joins us after the break. Back in a moment, Observer Live. But here's the thing. Afterwards, we had this big momentous moment where you were confronted by none other than Nick Nemeth, who was making his TNA wrestling debut. I want to get your thoughts on uh, Nick Nemeth coming into the company. Oh, um, even though he took me out, which I'm going to get mine back when the time is right. Um, but let's leave that alone. Uh, but talk about Nick coming to the company. I think it's huge for TNA. Obviously, um, I'm a huge fan of his. Um, he's a superstar. I mean, he he's he's done everything in professional wrestling. He's been a world champion. He's been a tag team guy. He's been a he's won every single title you could think about. He's had it. Um, he's been all over the world. Um, he has a he he um, he has a huge buzz going right now. And for him to pick TNA over AEW in New Japan or any other company he's working, that shows that TNA is a, is a hot spot right now, right? Um, so I'm happy he's part of the team. I'm happy I get to do something down the road with him. Um, and I'm, I'm happy that TNA is is starting to be a, a spot where people want to come to. Same thing with Ash by Elegance, um, her picking us over other companies out there um i'm happy she's part of the team and um i can't wait to see what um the future brings with nick and ash and my last question to you is dream opponents you're the champ now man you know you're gonna have everybody coming after you who are some of the opponents that you're like let's go i need to get a match with this person oh man the first one that comes to mind is not he doesn't even it's not a full-time guy in our company but we kind of had a um, had a preview of the tapings in Vegas was Okada. Um, he's a, a guy I would like to have another one on one match with. It's been six years since I had a one on one match with him. I was a kid. Um, actually, it was longer than six years. It was I've been wrestling for ten, so it was nine years ago because I was one year into wrestling when I had a singles match with Okada. So I was a kid. I was I was a, a kid in wrestling. So I would like to have another one-on-one match now that I'm a f- adult in wrestling. And I would like to see how that plays out.
Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, BB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. What's going on, Mike? What's up? That music abruptly ended and threw me off. Yes, it did. <laughs> you know, I I leave here and there. I go, I go hither and yon. I've heard. Hey, you know, when I'm gone, it's like, you know, Vinny comes over to do a show, but he's like over there. And then my parents come over because they live nearby and they hang out, stay here. But like they're downstairs. And uh, man, I come back and like everything is so screwed up up here. Like, is my dad here like pretending he's doing the show? Like what's going on? <laughs> the, the camera was like three inches. If you go back to the opening segment, the camera's like three, four inches lower. It's like from here on down. And then yesterday it was pointing over there. And then we had a power surge, and so, you know, I find out when the show's on the air and uh, Filthy can't connect. Were there a bunch of things in the room askew by chance? Like, just in my area. Because what are, exactly are they doing over there, do you think? I, I don't know. I'm going to have to find out. And hey, it ain't easy to move that camera up and down. That's the other thing. Well, look, being such a control freak as you are and such a tightly wrapped human being in the way that you are, I got to give you credit because it's one thing to let your parents come over when you're not around. In fact, not even not around. You're an entire ocean away, but then you let your friends like Vinny in. Are you sure that it's only Vinny who's coming in here? or do you? Well, think you know, Sean shows up and, and they may be having parties like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like, clean up when you're done, but don't mess with my camera. You're going to have to say that to, like, you know, later on to your daughters. It's like, okay, whatever you do, I don't want anybody over to this house. I don't want any boys over to this house. But you know what? I know kids are going to party. You're going to do what you're going to do. But whatever you do, don't mess with my microphone. Actually, you know what's funny is uh, we'll get in the news in a second, everybody. But Mike's been gone for a while. I have. You know, I, I uh, my, my kids, it's years. like they don't know what's going on, you know. Although Paisley's, she's now, she's about to turn eight. Tomorrow, actually, is her eighth birthday, which is impossible to believe. Aww. And, you know, Hanalei's four. And it's like, I don't think they know anything about anything, like, regarding what I do. But, like, every now and then, you know, we come up here and we watch shows before bed. They sit on the couch over there and they watch shows and I read or whatever. And every now and then, Paisley will walk over here and she'll sit in this chair and she'll start doing a show. And, like... <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like, how do you know any of this? But she'll go, how's it going, everybody? And she'll do like a little mini show. Oh, my like, God. Something... Hey, now, if, when you leave the room at night, does she go, I'll talk to you again after a while? No, they don't do oh. that. I will record it someday. Actually, the one thing I wish I could find a recording of, and like, I, you know, I save everything. It's all on my Dropbox, but there's like a year or two that I don't know if I switched computers and didn't upload or something, but... When she was, uh, I mean, little, she was under three. I think I've told this story before. And this is something that is non-wrestling, but I know a lot of you have kids. Okay, so listen. If you have a kid, and they're maybe one, two years old, and you read them the same book all the time. She used to always read uh, Little Fur Family. Okay, this book, Little Fur Family. And it's, it's a book for little kids, but it's not like it's, you know, simple. I mean, it's you read them a story. It's a story. And uh, one day when she was, you know, maybe two and a half, couldn't read, you know, she was for sure under three. I uh, was going to read her the book again. And just as a joke, I said, why don't you read the book to me today? And she opened the book and she did the entire book cover to cover. But she couldn't read. It was like, if you read a little youngster a book over and over again, they'll memorize the entire book. And I sat her down in front of the mic, and I said, read me the book. And she read the entire book into the microphone. It's the cutest thing you've ever heard. Like, she can barely even, like, it's crazy. So I wish I could find that recording, because it is absolutely amazing. Her reading Little Fur Family. Reading, I put in, you know, quotation marks. But if you if you have a kid that they're they're that age and you read them the same book, try it one day. Just go read the book yeah. to me. And they'll go through the whole book. It's crazy. I wish I had a memory like that. Hey, repetition is the key. You ever heard that expression? There's a great example of it. Now I cannot wait though until she is able to read all sorts of books. Read it. 
Lots I can of wait for that one. Well, Lord, I remember I when a... your son found out you were hated. <laughs> By you. That, that was the coming. worst part of the deal. But here's the thing. I cannot wait till she says, Daddy, read me the story of Ole Anderson. Oh, man. Tell me about that time that Uncle Dave and you interviewed Ole Anderson and, and he said words that were not fit for national radio. He wasn't, but you know what? You know what I got to say about Ole? What's that? That's a man that lived it. He lived his gimmick. His gimmick was a curmudgeonly old, yes. grumpy, but that was life. Yes, you know what I mean. And and uh, you know the the famous uh, we call it the Horseman beatdown. I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate, but we've been using that term for years and years and years. You know, you do the tag match and then you turn on the guy. It's a three on one beatdown. I mean, I waited years. I was always like, "This has got to be the Horseman," and then they didn't do it. And hey, you know what's funny? I don't know if it's funny, but I don't know what they were planning to do on Friday or what they are planning to do. But we do have Bailey and Dakota Kai against (laughs) the other members of Damage Control. And we might get that horseman beat down this coming Friday on SmackDown. Hey, Brian, you want to draw an even more pronounced line to it? Sting is going to North Carolina, and he is trusting in Ric Flair, who just walked into the Young Bucks locker room. Well, I don't know if he's trusting in Ric Flair. I think we're going to find out that he doesn't trust this guy. Well, the whole and we're going to find out what's going on after all of these years. After all of these years, one thing that Sting, if you looked at the kayfabe magazines, always pointed out was how can you continue to fall for Ric Flair? How can you continue to fall for the Horsemen? So. You know, we we may get some sort of takeoff on that, although I kind of hope at the end of the day, uh, Ric Flair isn't the one that's turning on Sting. Well, I think they'll do. There, there's two. You know what? Here's the thing. There's two choices, okay? And I really don't care which one they do because you can make either of them work, all right? It's Sting's final match. So your two options are Sting pretends like he's going with the Young Bucks, but then, I'm sorry, Ric Flair. Ric Flair pretends he's going with the Young Bucks. But then, of course, he screws them to give Sting the big victory. Okay? I like that. I that's like that that's one. easy. But you know what? You know what? He's there for three years. The other one is... They wear the same suits now. Sting does, in fact, on his final <laughs> match, get almost screwed by Ric Flair. Ric Flair tries to screw him in his final match, but Sting foils him again and ends up getting the victory and it was sting on either way very, sting wins very last nitro he did get the victory over rick flair that did happen there so you know sting going out on top i would like to see this here and again you got these goofy ratings and everything go ahead and use the ratings to do a, a tag team title tournament you know after after the fact but it'll be interesting to see what they do decide to do there but I know we don't have a whole lot of time for Ole Anderson today, but as you said, he was the quintessential cantankerous man, but he was also the quintessential tough guy wrestler, the quintessential great promo, a great tag team wrestler, the quintessential tag team wrestler, and then a brother tag team, you know, combination at that, even though he wasn't actually brothers with Gene Anderson. You got some people have a little different philosophy if you're teaming with a brother than you would just a normal tag team member, and what he and Gene Anderson were able to do, if you go to the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame book by Greg Oliver and Steven Johnson came out in 2005, the number six tag team of all time, Ole and Gene Anderson. And he gets a lot of... Number six of all time? Number six of all time. Wow. Gets a lot of deserved, because of his personality and because of his failings as a booker late in the game, He uh, those are a lot of demerits against him. And he didn't do anything to help his cause at times because of his personality. But the reality is, is there was a lot of other years where Ole Anderson was incredibly successful at what he did. And he probably will never be in the Observer Hall of Fame, him nor Gene Anderson. But you well, got to be honest. At this they, point, after 15 years, know, they, it ain't going to happen. Abs- but they absolutely deserve it. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. about the process of bringing her in and just how you felt about that. Uh, 
listen, more than anything, I can identify with people coming out of another company and maybe feeling like they never got utilized to their fullest potential. And, you know, that's how she felt. And I didn't know Ash before. And of course, we, you know, it's a small world, the wrestling world, whether you know people or not, you feel like you know them, you know of them, you know people, you know, there's always a connection. And so many people were telling me, you know, she wants to work. She wants to do something, you know, generally she could go say to AEW or something like that. And you just never know what's going to happen. At least I think we are known for at least pretty much when someone comes into our company, we're going to utilize them. Um, I think that's a known fact and people can just sit back and watch our product and see that. And also the knockouts division is also hey, we averaged three female matches on a pay-per-view. Uh, we pretty much use every single girl in that locker room. Um, that's enticing to talent, right? And they want to be used and they want to, and I've heard about her work ethic. She's really expressed and every other person that worked with her vouched for her work ethic. I respect that. You know, I, I like those people who are hungry and want it and want to add something to our division. And I think she's going to be a great addition. I think she's already made a splash and now let's see what she's got in the ring and everything else. And I can't wait to see her new character and what she wants to bring to it. She's excited. Um, so I think the fans are going to be pleasantly surprised, right? I just can never give her enough props because of not only the performer that she is, but the human being that she is. You know, she's never changed from the girl that I met in NXT. I worked with her, I think people forget, when she first came into WWE because I was there on the main roster. And she was, and of course, everyone coming into the company is going to be all timid and nice. She's never changed from that person. If anything, she's only gotten better. She is so, it's a testament when you see her interact with the fans and how much they love her and all her loyal fans. And, the love that she gives back. So I'm talking about outside the ring right now and to see her in the ring. Listen, we can already, we already know she's a star, right? And to see her level up in the ring, because obviously we have a great division. We give the girls a lot of time. We feature them a lot, main events. She has killed it. And I think it just, opened up this confident, newfound confidence for her as well. And I, I remember her when she came into the company, I wasn't there actually, I was doing Amazing Race at the time for her debut, I missed that. <laughs> I had dealt, I had talked to her before. And then I saw, I mean, she had her first match with Kylan King, which was off the charts. Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. we got so much to talk about here. I do want to mention that later on tonight, Brian and Vinny show. It is the last Brian and Vinny of February, and it is Black History Month. And so tonight, we'll be watching the following WrestleMania 37 matches. We have got Lashley versus Drew McIntyre, Apollo Crews versus Big E, and yes, the Nigerian drum fight. And Bianca, Belair, and Sasha, which would be the, I believe, first time two black women headlined a, a WWE pay-per-view night. So that's coming up here tonight. And we have not made a decision about next month. But uh, I think it's going to be that uh, WWF, um, God, I always forget what it's called. I always think it's Collision. Superstar? Challenge. Challenge. Some mid-80s challenge. So we can get back into, these are the four you're going to watch. You'll know week after week after week, et cetera. Now, are you going back into the the 80s or are you sticking in the 90s with these? What do you mean? I mean, where, where, where are you pulling these out of here, these the superstars? 80s. What era? Or the challenges? Challenge. The 80s? Okay. 80, they got 80s challenge ups, like 86, 87. Okay, the so I think we need to go back to uh, to that, yeah. For us old men here. Hey, listen, I enjoyed I enjoyed some of the uh, those 90s superstars shows. I might have been the only one 
Well, here's the thing with the 80s ones. You know, the matches aren't much because that's not what WWF did. You know, you get all those squash matches, but what really makes it are some of the interviews and some of the vignettes and things like that that we see today but were groundbreaking or, you know, certainly jarring for a lot of old wrestling fans back then, but there's a lot of very entertaining stuff in there too. It says, get some Ron Simmons in there. We did, like, two weeks ago. Yeah. We had the, uh, the first, uh, what, what, what was it, 90, 90? I forget the, the show it was, but. Tama Tonga is heading to WWE. There's a members-only story by Dave up on the front page of WrestlingObserver.com. But the gist of it is, Tama Tonga is heading to WWE. <laughs> now, what are you going to do with this guy? I could tell you. I think it's very obvious that he ain't coming to not be a part of the bloodline. Wait feud. a second. He's not going to be a good brother? No, I don't think so. But, you know, I was thinking about this, and, you know, there's a million things they can do. But I think the the easiest one is that if you've been watching the show for a long time, it is very, very clear that Roman has been telling Solo Sokoa you are the next tribal chief. And Solo Sokoa, if you've looked at his booking, obviously at some point he's turning babyface to feud with Roman Reigns. Well, how does this happen? I don't know, but I could see a simple storyline where Tama Tonga comes in and all of a sudden he's Roman's guy. And he's the one getting everything that Solo used to get. You know, Roman drops the line that he could be the... And Solo... You know, he's the odd man out, and finally he does the big split, and there's your Solo Sokoa Roman Reigns feud. And then Tama Tonga is Roman's second in command or whatever. They're going to need something for Roman to do once he's no longer champion. And uh, a feud with the bloodline Solo Sokoa, I mean, you could do something there. Or he might end up a good brother, but I don't think that's what's going to end up happening. Well, I mean, it just depends on how long you want this story arc to go with The Rock and with the bloodline. Because could are we bringing in Jacob Fatu possibly down the line? Is this just the first of a couple of people that they could bring in? You know, something that's been rumored for a while. Something I think it was Jacob Fatu talked about when he wanted his release from MLW was that they actually contacted everybody and wanted them to be a part of something. So... They could absolutely do something like this, but it just, I guess, depends on how long you want to try to draw it out for. I think Tamatanga joining WWE is the best possible move for everybody. I think if you put, give him a new name, give him a little bit of a new coat of paint, introduce him in as one of the island boys. Yes, he is not Samoan, but Haku, all that stuff. He might as well be just like Snuka. All that sort of stuff, you know, that we're all in the family together. He is here. considered part of the family. Part of the family. Even though he's not actually yeah. part of the family. Yeah, it's it's that island linkage that, that is out there. So I think this is the best move because him going to impact or him going to AEW to me, he goes in as Tamatanga. I think he's just another guy who has some good matches and I just don't I don't see where he can it doesn't. He doesn't maximize his potential. He may win more titles there. He may be in more five star matches there. Whatever, but I don't think it's the best thing for him. He goes to TNA. He's a huge fish in a small pond. They can bank on him. He's great. He can work with the young guys. He would be new to a lot of people. There could be some good things there. But the problem is for him, it's the least paying of all of the gigs, and it's the least shine out of all of them. So I like this opportunity for him, and if it works out well for him. Who knows if it opens the door again for Tango Loa, who was there at one point, and Hikuleo, who, again, he's got to develop a lot more in New Japan, but if he continues to do that, he still may be a guy because of his size and his look that WWE is interested in down the line. Pernier says, isn't a Rock going to turn baby, or Roman going to turn baby face? I don't think so at all. Listen. He could. Th there's, no, here's the thing. Uh, obviously, the eventually. Yeah. Okay, but The Rock was not supposed to do this heel gimmick. The Rock was supposed to be the babyface versus Roman Reigns. Didn't work out. So, Rock's going full heel, okay? But I see this whole WrestleMania thing as The Rock playing the role of Mike Tyson in the Shawn Michaels 
Steve Austin 1998 WrestleMania deal. He is a heel now, but ultimately there is going to be a split and he is going to be the babyface versus Roman Reigns as the heel and they will do Rock and Roman down the line. I don't see Rock being the heel in that situation and Roman Reigns being the babyface because Rock did not come back to be a heel. He's embraced the heel role because that's what ended up happening, but that was not what he came here to do. So I think that he will be turning babyface. The Rock will remain the heel for when you do the Rock versus Roman match. Now, I guess we'll go to this here. We got some hirings and some promotions. Rob Fee, which, man, is that ever an NXT name or what? Rob Fee, the former Marvel writer, announced Tuesday his now his new title, WWE Director of Character Development. He was first hired as the, quote, Director of Long-Term Creative in September of 2022. And he wrote some exciting news. Last year, I moved to Florida to be able to work with talent directly on every aspect of their characters. Today, my title is officially WWE Director of Character Development. And he was congratulated by Ariel Helwani. Made sure to get his congratulations in. He once pitched a movie based on Bray Wyatt's The Fiend and played a pivotal role in the development of the White Rabbit campaign leading to his return at Extreme Rules 2022. Also, Patrick Scott, indie wrestler, has retired from wrestling, and he is now a member of... Well, he's a he's a WWE creative writer's assistant, which means he is an assistant to the writers, but he has now gotten that job, left North Carolina as an independent wrestler, Woke up yesterday in Connecticut, an employee of WWE. <laughs> so funny. Nothing. I just, I don't know. You know, sometimes you fall asleep in places and you wake I up. I have never fallen just, asleep and so woke like up in WWE. It's like a world. You know, you're like, oh my God, how did this happen? What is his exact title again? His bulky title that he has now? Are you talking about Rob what? Fee? Yes. Uh, Rob Fee is the, uh... damn it, Mike. Vice President of... Rob Fee is the WWE Director of Character Development. Is that above or below? I guess it would be below because it doesn't have a senior in front of it. The Vice President of Talent Development Creative. Brother, if the Michael check cash is, I don't care what it is or where it <laughs> ranks. Call me whatever you want. Kidding me? <laughs> I don't even know what my title is. I've been this, I've been doing this since 95. Thought you were boss, man. I guess maybe I'm a CEO. Isn't that fancy? Is that a fancy enough title? I don't know. <laughs> Tokyo Sports article confirmed Julia will leave stardom at the end of March when her contract expires. Breaking news from no Tokyo kidding. Sports. Thank wow. you. Yes. It's first reported by our own Dave Meltzer. She is expected to join WWE eventually, but only after helping stardom founder Rossi Ogawa with a new promotion. The reason she is delaying her WWE start is so she can be there to kick off the promotion for a while, get the promotion going, then she is going to end up with WWE at some point. So she had been with Stardom since 2019, started with Ice Ribbon 2017, one-time Wonder of Stardom champion, one-time World of Stardom champion, current New Japan Strong women's champion. And a hell of an ass kicker she is. And looks good. She's awesome. No matter what the hairstyle is. Just a fantastic total package. That'll be great for WWE if, and she's apparently working on this, if she can learn enough English to get a little bit more of a promo down. Asuka has been able to survive without having, you know, English promo skills, but it will not hurt this woman's game at all to pick up some more English because, again, if things work out the way they hopefully will for her, she could be a star. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. How did you feel about your performance in the Rumble? Um, it went 
it went really well. Like all the girls were, they made me look incredible. Um, and thank God for that because like they're there, they're, that's, they're there and they could, the WWE fans can see them every week if they wanted to. But that was, I only have one chance. Like, I felt like my career was riding on that. <laughs> like that's, that's just how it felt. And, uh, for all the girls to just make me look as, as good as they made me look. It was, it was incredible. That moment with Naomi, a former knockouts champion, you guys hug and then you guys start like, just like going at it. What was that even like? Like, was it deja vu? I don't know. She, well, first of all, the reaction we got was so cool. Um, I thought I didn't, I didn't expect like all the people to kind of know our history. So the fact that when we were standing off initially, they had that reaction, we hugged, they had a reaction. And then when we started fighting, they had a reaction. It was just, it was so perfect. It was chef's kiss. Um, that was so freaking cool. And the fact that we wrestled, what, two weeks ago in front of a sold out crowd for TNA, their comeback show, like for the Knockouts World title, everything was just so perfect. Yeah, she is an incredible athlete and an incredible wrestler. And I never thought I'd be in the ring with her at taking her finish, period. So the fact that that happened was actually crazy um it, what's funny was when we when everything we were playing the match whatever um and i said have you ever done you know your finisher on the apron and she said no she hadn't we we went over it went in a practice ring it wasn't working and we didn't have a chance to go out we know that the the ring aprons are bigger outside uh but we didn't have a chance to go out and like feel it out and one of the producers was like you don't have to have to do it if y'all didn't go over it and I just told her, like, do it. And if there's not enough room, just throw me on the ground. Like, just do it from the apron to the ground. And thank God that didn't happen. But I, I, was, tell, I was telling the producer, like, I would do this in front of 500 people, much less 50,000 people. So I didn't have a problem with it at all. And uh, she's an amazing wrestler. And I feel like she would have protected me regardless of if we had to do it to the floor or not. <laughs> Yes, I was like, when I was watching it, I was nervous because I'm like, first of all, like you're taking this brutal bump. But then on top of that, Bianca, we know was supposed to be standing tall. And I was like, oh my God, what if she like loses her balance? What if she falls oh. too? Like, I was thinking like all of these things, but you guys went, I mean, you guys are pros, man. She's so good. No, no chance of that. She would have been fine. No, she would have no. just, she would have fallen off the apron and landed on my body. And like... <laughs> Ryan Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. You know, NXT tonight, Ilya Dragunov, Carmelo Hayes face-to-face. -face. Noam Dar versus a member of the No Quarter Catch crew. Gallows and Anderson versus Edris Nofe and Malik Blade. Von Wagner and Lexus King. Kiana James and Kalani Jordan. Dijak and Luca Crucifino and Ridge Holland speaks. You know, they actually could have Tamatanga show up as part of the good brothers in nxt if they want him to do an nxt run for a while and then make his debut at mania i guess we'll find out but anyway the uh the other thing is uh booker t returns and i saw Ooh. i saw that in the observer awards booker t i believe won worst announcer boo is that right yeah Boo. This this is wrong, okay? And I was thinking about it, and here's here's No Brian Rose, he's not. No, he's not. Okay. And you watch NXT. Booker has been gone, and they have replaced him with Byron Saxton. There's no way that Booker is worse than Byron Saxton. And the thing is that Booker T and Byron Saxton. Both have a tendency to say stupid things, okay? But Byron says stupid things, and he's boring. Booker says stupid things, and at least, like, there's never a dull moment. With panache. It adds a little bit of extra fun to the show. 
that you don't get with Byron Saxon. And on top of that, on top of that, I don't know what's happened in the last week, okay? But Michael Cole has careened off a cliff, and it's starting to make me mad, okay? Like, he has been much better without Vince yelling in his headset. But for some reason this past week, he said so many stupid things. It's back to, like, the same generic, you know, it's it's back to the same generic WWE speak. Then he's saying stupid stuff like, you know, what was the one the other day? Uh... Uh, anyway, somebody was like a boxer. Tyler Bate. He goes, Tyler Bate's a boxer by trade. I'm like, no, he's not. You know, by trade means it's just. And then yesterday, yesterday, the show opened with like a recap or something, and he's doing the thing where he's laughing at it, the fake laughter, which like I haven't, I haven't had to hear him do that in years. He's back to doing the fake laughter, and then they had a spot where um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody had somebody upside down. And they swung him into the bottom turnbuckle. And Cole loses his mind. He goes, that should be illegal. And I'm like, why? Their head got rammed into the buckle. It happens in every single match. It's worse because they were swung into it. And he kept going on and on about it should be illegal. And I'm like, in like literally in what? Like you could do that to someone in UFC in a cage and they wouldn't be disqualified. What are you talking about? And just like all throughout the show, I'm like, God, they have to hear that Booker T wins worst announcer. I'm like, that's not right. But anyway, he's back. To, I'm going to possibly correct you, but it does open the door for you to then jump on his old man references. But could it possibly be that because of his age, he was referencing uh, the boxer by Simon and Garfunkel in the line about you know, being a fighter by trade. Well, I'm sure he was possible? saying, but like, do you know what by trade means? I'll tell you what Tyler Bate isn't by trade. <laughs> a boxer, okay? He's a wrestler by trade. That's his trade. I don't care what he did 10 years ago. He ain't a boxer by trade. I had a whole list of things that Cole said on that Australia pay-per-view that just, I was stabbing at my eyes well, here's and my ears. I, I, look, I, I'm not defending this at all. but Sounds like, like you are. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I haven't even said anything yet, but hasn't this been a guy that has also been trying to get out of play by play for a long time. And it makes no excuse. I give him permission to be, get out. You should be a professional every time out. But do you think that there is a level of sometimes just going through the motions, especially well, when no, the bigger when, issue, well, hold on, especially when one of his main jobs at this point is to basically hold Pat McAfee's hand in between Pat McAfee exploding and doing Pat McAfee things. Here's the thing. I give him a little bit of the benefit of the doubt because how many times have I opened up this show and you're not here and I still say that whoever is replacing you is you, okay? Yes. <laughs> Old habits die hard. He's had to do this stupid crap for two decades, yeah. and now all of a sudden he doesn't have to, but he can't help himself. But that's his default but, switch. But there's stuff you don't have to say. Which is, it should be illegal to get your head smashed into a turnbuckle. <laughs> like, illegal? We should call the police? Is that what you're saying? What do you, what do you mean by illegal? It police! should be a disqualification <laughs> to ram someone's head into the turnbuckle, a spot from 1942? Now, I'm getting ahead of myself. We gotta talk about these ratings in Raw very quickly. Not a lot to talk about. Rampage, 364 and a .11. That's fine. Smackdown. 2.3 million and 0.62. That's good. Collision, a 385 and a 0.11. Now, my whole point, I just want to bring this up. I've said this before. They're always going to get killed versus a WWE pay-per-view, including a WWE pay-per-view that airs 12 hours earlier or something. <laughs> That's not good, though. That WWE pay-per-view aired at 2 o'clock a.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern, okay? <laughs> I know they claimed, oh, people are having stay-up late parties to watch the show. Okay. <laughs> we're getting have breakfast I'm with sure two dozen the elimination wild animals decided they were going to do that. <laughs> the rest of us watched it Saturday night, okay? And it killed Collision. And that's the problem is, is well, not the problem, but it, it. I guess it really truly does show that you have all that time during the day. It's not like this rubbed right up against collision coming on you had a lot of time during the day but 
I guess people are just that cre- that big of creatures of habit where they won't tune in at any point before, you know, at least enough people to hurt AEW's show, you know, that they were going to be, we're watching our wrestling at eight and that's how this works. And there's only one show we're going to watch. And that's that. When he says, so folks waited until 8 PM to watch a 5 AM show. Yes. A lot of people did. It happens every time. Well, that's unless you figure that they just didn't care about collision this week (laughs) with a Brian Danielson main event. They they waited until the evening to watch the show. It happens and, every and time look, they do an overseas show. This is a thing. Well, that's the thing is, I mean, I don't know how many times we have to compare this, you know, with Clash of the Castle or because Saudi Arabia is usually a different day and all that sort of stuff. No, Saudi I mean, Arabia is usually Saturday morning. Is it? So, I mean, there there you go. I mean, if that's the case, then how many times does it have to happen before you accept it? That's probably part of the trend. So the Raw show... We're going to do the full review. Actually, we did the full review with Dave. But uh, not a lot to talk about. But I will say this. A lot of angles. A lot of talking. A lot of quick matches. Although we did have two. uh, We had a street fight. We had actually Shinsuke Nakamura and Sami Zayn turn into a very good match. But we missed literally half of it. Because they did two commercial breaks during this match for reasons I cannot explain. Sammy got the win, and they're doing a storyline where Gunther needs a challenger for Mania, and he has brought up multiple names. He has been approached by multiple people, and I think that what's going to happen is we're going to have our usual WrestleMania, you know, Royal uh, Battle Royal with everybody who does not have a spot on the show. The winner of the Battle Royal on night one gets Gunther on night two, and I presume the winner of that will be Sami Zayn, and I presume Sami Zayn beats Gunther for the title. That's I hate that so much. Where I think they're going there. I hate it so much. I like the people involved in it. There's got to be a better way to get there in all of this time. Well, they can do a multi-person. Oil. Oh, but uh, there is uh, there's a lot going on there. I need more tension and stakes in the ending of this guy's, you know, five year title reign, whatever it's been now for Gunther, nine hundred days or whatever it is. I mean. To me, it's, I, I don't know, maybe I'm romanticizing it too much, but it to me, it needs to have impact. I don't care who it is. You can tell a story with Gable and Zane and all of these guys and have them all competing against each other because they're all fighting for the same thing here, you know? But to me, there's a better way to build the drama than do it with a battle royal. I hope there is at least. And we had New Day and Imperium, which Imperium won clean because it was a street fight, no DQ. And this was also a good match. Those were the Thank only God. two. Vinci helped. That was nice. Real good matches on the show. And then other than that, we had a we had two segments that like I don't know what they were thinking, if it was better on paper, but we had the Drew Seth promo where they're gonna be facing off for the title at Mania. But Drew's thing was You should be concentrating on the match with me. Why are you going to SmackDown? Why are you involved in the bloodline? Why are you involved with Roman? Your your attention is diverted. They're going to get involved in our match. They're going to ruin it. And Seth's argument was, somebody's got to stop them. And I was like, well, that's definitely a story, but I should be caring more about Seth versus Drew when a promo segment is over and not less. And that's how I felt watching this. It was like... That's the championship match, but they're busy doing a build for a tag team match, probably on night one, the Cody and Seth versus Roman and Rock. What color was uh, Rollins' outfit? Would you call that Merlot? I was not even paying any attention. Then we had uh, the other big thing at the end was uh, Cody beats Grayson Waller, and then Paul Heyman comes out with who he claimed were three suspended New York cops. They were his thugs, and he wants... Cody to you know back off on his challenge to rock and Cody says no that took me what seven seconds well this took them 10 minutes (laughs) Paul Heyman is a great promo but man that brother was struggling out there he was struggling to try to get 10 minutes out of this promo in which there was nothing other than that that was said. So, and then, you know, Cody beats up the cops, says the bloodline is not hunting him, he's hunting the bloodline. I mean, you know, the fans were into it or whatever, but it was a really weird, long, drawn-out, 
Nothing happened in the last segment on the show. And then the last thing I want to mention is I was very hard on Nia Jax on Saturday. Her match with Rhea Ripley. Mm -hmm. Thought she sucked. And, uh, you know, I had people, I don't know what match they were watching. I begged them to go back and just watch Nia's performance and get back to me. But I will say, and man, I was watching with a critical eye. She was miles better in this match with Liv Morgan. And it was actually almost also infuriating because she made Liv Morgan, like, she sold so much more for Liv than she did for Rhea in Australia. And she was totally fine in this match with Liv. And then Becky flew in and attacked her. Because you see, the more things change, the more they stay the the same. Becky is getting a championship match at WrestleMania, and therefore she must beat a giant. It is Becky versus Nia next week, which was set up actually months ago when Nia beat Becky clean to set up Nia's title match in Australia. Now Becky will get her win over Nia, and that will lead to her match with Rhea at WrestleMania. So there you go. Yeah. And before we go, just want to send a shout out to Raquel Rodriguez going out there and crushing Chelsea Green going through this MCAS thing that she has. It can't be fun to to be dealing with this stuff right now, but I'm happy she's back. Look good in the Elimination Chamber. I like her as a monster, different monster than Nia, but good for her. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. What made you make that leap, though, from from gymnastics to pro wrestling? Like, what happened there? Yeah, so my story is um, a little different. So I was finishing up my fifth year at Michigan State in gymnastics, and I got a message on Instagram from the WWE recruit page um, asking me, hey, would you like to come to a tryout at SummerSlam? This was the Nashville one, so in 22. And at first, I'm like, is this real? Like, there's no way that WWE is contacting me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for it. So I went down to Nashville. I did the tryout. And thankfully, I was blessed with the opportunity for a Triple H himself to offer me to come to the Performance Center and start training. And that's how I got into pro wrestling. I never would have thought in a million years that I would be a WWE superstar. So being here is so surreal. How has that training been like for you from going from gymnast to pro wrestling? Yeah. So I will say it's very, very different. It's foreign to me, but then again, the physicality of it 